what a privilege it is to call you Father. Lord, you are a perfect and righteous and holy, compassionate and long-suffering and gracious and merciful Father. And Lord, you can be all of those things and intensify our knowledge of them because your Son perfectly lived out your holiness and your righteousness. But because of his sacrifice, we can be recipients of grace, of mercy, of love, of compassion. For your love covers over a multitude of our sins in Christ and his cross. And so, Lord, we, fathers and everyone else today, while we honor our dads, we honor you, our Heavenly Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So just to kind of set the stage of where we're at today is uh, we have been in a section that I believe began in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. And I think it sort of ends or moves into a different area past uh, verses 8 to 12. But what we see in here is that Peter is writing and showing what excellent behavior amongst unbelievers should look like. If you're a citizen of the United States, this is how you keep your behavior excellent amongst your neighbors and your co-workers and your political officials. If you're an employee and you answer to an employer who may treat you unjustly, this is the recipe, this is the gospel motive for responding to your boss in a godly way. And so he sort of narrows the focus because most of our lives is not voting, though that's important. Most of our lives is not 9 to 5 Monday through Friday. That's 40 hours. There's still a chunk of change of hours, 128 hours, that you men and women live with your spouse. And long after you retire, you'll be with your spouse. And so he says, is your neighbors and others in your extended family at the quinceaneras look at your life and your marriage? This is what would show your adornment of God and keep your behavior excellent with your spouse. And that's really what we look at in verses one to six. And I want you to well, one to seven. I want you to notice that there is a so that to the wives and a so that to the husbands. The the purpose of wives submitting to the loving servant leadership of their husbands is so that their unbelieving husband could be won to Jesus without a word. Won to Jesus without a word. Just by the behavior of their believing wife. And the husband's word and instruction to us as husbands also has a so that. Notice in verse 7, so that your prayer life, men, will not be hindered. And as I was praying through this this morning on the shady side of a building, trying to find refuge in our hot June day, I thought, you know what, bookends this whole passage is the glory of God. Everything leads us to God. It's so that your unsaved neighbor can glorify God. He can look at your marriage like Mr. Paul Berry looked at me at EP Fitness some years ago in his 80s, played NFL uh, with Pittsburgh Steelers. He was a construction guru here in El Paso. And he looked at me and he said, you know, you and your wife have something special. He said, I've seen a lot of people here at EP Fitness. I've seen a lot of marriages. And he said, you have something special. There's something unique about your relationship. And I said, you know what, it's all, it's, it's the Lord. It is God. And so he could look at our marriage and he could glorify God on the day of visitation. 
And then I want you to see, husbands, that where this sort of culminates as we move to this inner concentric circle of the marriage of the wife to the husband, and now today to the, from the husband to the wife, it all comes back to God. And, and I say that because there's focus on the family, there's focus on marriage, there's marriage retreats, there's marriage reinvigoration, there's marriage books, and those are helpful, and sometimes those are necessary, but the whole point, guys, of your marriage is not your wife, and the whole point of your marriage, ladies, is not your husband. The point is God. The reason we respond, husbands, to our wives in a knowledgeable way in an honoring way, is so that our prayers won't be hindered. And why is that such a big big deal? Because the whole point is Him. Him. The point of your marriage, gentlemen, is God. Ladies, the point of your marriage is God. That's, That's it. And that's so helpful for us to remember before we look into the specifics of this. Now, when Peter uses the word here that is translated wives, he actually refers to a word that means female or woman. You've heard of gynecology? I think it's that idea of of a wife as a woman. It, it, It specifically emphasizes, and it's in italics in the NASB, it says, you husbands in the same way live with your wives, but it's specifically calling attention to her being a female, of the female gender. And so he's pointing us, husbands, to the knowledge that God requires us to have of the female sex. And I thought, man, some of my jokes that I've heard and grown up with just don't work. In fact, maybe they're blasphemous, I don't know. (laughs) My dad was a godly man, but he would say, Women, you don't understand them, you just love them. You've heard that one? Or you heard the one about the highway patrolman that pulled a husband over? And he said, sir, um, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but your wife fell out about a mile back of the car. And the husband went, phew, thank the Lord, I thought I'd gone deaf. And I thought, oh, I've told those jokes, I've used those axioms, but when you get into 1 Peter 3, 7, it doesn't work. Guys, yes, that is a maledom reaction to the female gender, but that's not what the Holy Spirit is telling us as husbands to do. He's saying, be a lifelong learner of your wife. Study your wife. What makes her tick when she's going through morning sickness? What makes your wife tick when you get married and you pull out? of the church parking lot and you take her three days drive away from her precious mom and there's tears. Learn what makes her tick in postpartum depression. Learn what makes your wife tick when she goes through menopause and perimenopause. When she's nursing her kids. When she's got all of this spaghetti, this God-given spaghetti coming at her men 24-7, 365, and you're kicking back, man, and ready to get on with it. And you wonder why your wife isn't responsive. Guys, we've got to study our wives. And the other thing, men, that we have to look at here is that the wife that I married at age 20. She was 20 and I was 21. And she just turned 50 and I just turned 51. The wife that I married 29 years ago is not the same woman today. When are we going to get this figured out, men? The problem with study, guys, is that we think you have a beginning date and an ending date. And the way we program our minds, men, is that we sort of pursue a girl like we go game hunting. I'm not a hunter, but those of you that are, you know, you pursue your game and you get it and then you show it off, right? And then, okay, the job's over. No, that's not what Peter is saying. He's saying you live with your wife according to knowledge 
and you live with your wife by showing her respect. And that is a continual, lifelong process through every stage of the moody monthly and all of the stages in a week and an emotional uh, progesterone to... uh, What are those other hormones? Estrogen. Estrogen cycles. So guys, it's not... It's not our option to cop out and say, well, women, you can't understand them, you just love them. That doesn't work. That does not work. For the husband who wants to have his prayer life unhindered, and for the husband who wants his marriage not to show off his wife only, but to show off her Savior to a world that desperately needs grace. As we do. So, let's dig into this a little bit. In the, uh, I think, best rendering of that first phrase, I would say it's husbands likewise dwelling together according to knowledge. In fact, I think the King James has it right when it says, Likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge. Knowledge. What in the world is he talking about? Go back to chapter 1 and look at verse 14. We've sort of moved by this point from all of the riches of the gospel of verses 3 down to verse 12. And there's a therefore in verse 13. Because of the gospel, here is how your life is to be different. And in verse 14 he says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust which were yours in your, underline the next word, ignorance. So there's a contrast, men, between ignorance and knowledge. Your marriage is to be different than that of your unbelieving golfing buddies, your mountain biking buddies that diss the name of Christ. Guys, this is different. When you come into Christ according to knowledge, your perspective on women and on marriage changes. I think it's appropriate to joke about men and to joke about women. Maybe we should be careful how we joke about marriage. Because you know, the world comes to work on Monday morning and said the old lady was nagging on me all weekend. Have you heard that kind of talk? That's according to ignorance. That's not marriage according to knowledge. You see, marriage according to knowledge is understanding that before I was living according to the empty way of life handed down by my forefathers, and so the tired, negative, critical, bummer jokes about marriage were hoorahed around the campfire with the guys. And that's ignorance, men. That's not knowledge talk about your wife, nor about my wife. There's a difference, and there is a knowledge. Your marriage, whether it's surviving, or it's struggling, or it's successful this morning, is a gift. It is not good that the man should be alone. The Creator, when everything was hunky-dory, looked on everything He had made and He said, this is not good that the man should be alone. I'm going to make him a helper. And He looked among the animals and there was no helper to be found. And so He caused him to fall into a deep sleep and from the man He takes a rib and He makes a woman. And then God took two naked people as He marches the groom down the aisle of the very first wedding where God is witness. And there's a song, there's poetry, there's nakedness, and there's no shame. And God looks at everything He had made and He said, this is very good. So there's the knowledge that your wife is a precious gift from God and that there are complementary roles in marriage. But there's another major idea here, and that is you show her honor. In verse 7, 
show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. You might respect the speed limit, but you certainly don't get out on the side of the road and plant flowers around it and salute it. You might respect the call of the referee in the basketball game, even though you might disagree with it, but you don't worship him and dote over him at the end of the game. So I think if your translation says show them respect, it might be a little bit weak. The idea of honoring your wife, notice in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 7, the same Greek word is translated this precious value is for those who believe. To you who believed, He is precious. Another translation renders it. Let your wife know how precious she is to you. That's how you honor her. You, you don't maybe treat the disposal dollar cup at Starbucks with that kind of honor. But men, if you get a mug from your four-year-old daughter with her big blue eyes looking up at you and it costs $22 saved up of her own money, you keep that mug in a special place. And you honor that mug. And you know where that mug is and you wash it out. You see, there's a, a type of honoring of our wives' men that is way over the top. And you give her care and courtesy. Let me ask you men, does your wife know beyond a shadow of a doubt that apart from Jesus Christ, you are to, they are to you the most precious relationship on this planet? Does your wife know that unequivocally? Preciousness, respect, honor. Where does that come from? Why is it men that so many women between the ages of 37 and 42 are walking out on their husbands and not looking back? But I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why, men, because we're, we're in love with our jobs or our sports or another night out with the boys. Mr. X comes in late, he works, and I'm not knocking working and working long hours. I don't want to, you know, put any heavies on people. That's part of providing for your family. But in this scenario, he's inconsiderate, and he's spent. And he comes into the house after emotional and physical exhaustion, and he turns to the usual spot where the mail is, discovers it isn't there. So without having said anything else, he asks, where's the mail? So his wife scurries off to find it, unless she's decided not to practice chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. And she says, go find it yourself. Which, of course, is a possibility, but not in this illustration. But as he waits for his meal, he, uh, he eats alone for the 17th night in a row, comfortably channel surfing, and surfing his smartphone for the latest text and emails and Twitter or whatever you guys, what do we do? And his wife watches him gulp down his food so that he can run out the door to hang out with the boys. And then he returns home from another night out with the boys, avoiding some of the awkward conflict that has arisen at home, the needs of his teenagers and of his wife and of the little ones, and he cranks up his iPhone on speaker to his favorite tune. Put another log on the fire. Cook me up some bacon and some beans. And go out to the car and change the tire. Wash my socks and sew my old blue jeans. Come on, baby, you can fill my pipe, and then go fetch my slippers and boil me another pot of tea. Then put another log on the fire, babe, and come and tell me why you're leaving me. 
You see, men, the interesting thing is that when you open your Bible and you start in Genesis and you go to Revelation and you look at the verbs addressed to husbands, none of them say rule your wife, none of them say command your wife, none of them say subject your wife, none of them say order your wife. What does it say? Husbands, it says to love your wife. Let them know how precious they are. And too many times, men, that the problem is that there's no meaningful communication, no tenderness, no understanding, no sweetness. And then the wife has no response. No wonder. So the honor that we bestow on our wives. And the idea of living with our wives according to knowledge tie in with some very interesting phrases. Notice the former is live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she's a woman. Now, let's notice a couple of things about that. The key to understanding the word weaker is the letters E-R. It's not that you're the strong macho guy and you're strong and she's weak. I think that Peter has already addressed that back in chapter 1, verse 24. He's basically said that all flesh is like grass and all of its glory like the flower of grass and the grass withers and the flower falls but the word of the Lord endures forever. So it's not that Peter's comparing strong with weak. Husband, macho, Wife, wimpy. That's not the comparison here. But he's saying of the two genders, the wife is generally weaker. And so the question is begged, what is he talking about? I know he's not talking about the fact that that, that wives are intellectually weaker or that they are morally weaker. I'm not even so sure, men, that he means that women are usually emotionally weaker. I don't think that's what he's talking about. Now, one possibility is that he's saying that generally the men can carry more bricks up the ladder. You know, we get that most of the time. That that, that typically the man is a stronger of the two, physically. That's one possibility. I think another possibility that we have to think about in terms of the wife being the weaker vessel is related to her role in verses 1 to 6. You've got to understand, in that culture, women were considered like goats, like animals. And in the Roman culture, women often had little or no rights. And so Peter knows that when he writes to women, he says, be subject to your unbelieving husbands, that he is in essence putting them in a potentially very vulnerable position. He's putting the women in a position that might be of great risk to them if abused by a domineering, overbearing, egotistical man. I think in our culture today, there's another implication of this. And that is, if men, your wife is committed to the idea of providing a home for the kiddos and making that her ministry, her primary focus, she is going to get a lot of pushback amongst her peers in some cases. That at some point there's going to be people that come to them and they're going to say, man, don't you know we're in the 21st century? Why do you hold on to this concept of giving a priority to supporting your husband, building a home for your kiddos, We are free. We are liberated. We have moved above and beyond that. That's Judeo-Christianity is holding you back. 
And she's going to get an earful of that in the tube, the, 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 the television and the, and the books and the ladies' coffee breaks. And so, in that sense, she's in a very vulnerable position. And I think what we have to do, men, is be careful that we don't make our wife do everything to the degree that she's overwhelmed with life and goes under. Otherwise, you make her feel useless or in control of nothing at all. Men, if there's delegation in marriage, it's not top-down, it is lateral delegation. So there's another phrase in verse 7. And show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of of life, and some people suggest that that's referring to biological and physical life of the marriage producing kiddos. That could very well be. But I think it's possible, maybe even probable, that what's, what he's referencing here is that if your wife is a believer in Jesus, they're in that sweet gospel spot. There's no male or female slave or freedman, Greek or Jew. And, and, and she gets the same privileges, men, before the throne of grace that you do. Nothing less. Everything that you get, she gets. The same precious blood that purchased you from the feudal way of life handed down by your forefathers bought her out of the slave market of sin. And you know what? She gets the same future benefits that you do. Remember back in chapter 1, we talk about an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, incorruptible, and reserved in heaven for us. See, that's where all of this is going. By the way, did you know that in uh, heaven, we're never going to have any... Uh, Problems with the PowerPoint light bulb, $400 going out. It's not going to happen. You see, my wife is going to die. And I always tell her, I got to go first, honey, cause, or we got to go out together. Because you can make it better without me than, than I can without you. But, you know, we don't have control over that. The truth is, she's going to die. And it might be before me, but that's not going to be the end. I'm going to see her again. And because Marcia Marie Meyerly, as a child, placed her faith in Jesus and His power of rising from the dead, she herself will be raised from the dead. Now, here's the thing that I have to think about, husband, and that you have to think about, men, is that my wife in heaven will still be Marcia. But she'll be a better version. You see, all the sin and the conflicts and the suffering and the struggle and the striving that goes on in being a husband and a wife and in being parents in a fallen world, that's all going to be done. It's all going to be gone. And once in a while now, I catch glimpses of who my wife will become. I see in shadow form what my bride will look like without the scars and the sin of this fallen world. And I don't know. I know there's no marriage in heaven, no giving in marriage in heaven. But we're going to have some type of a brother-sister relationship being fellow heirs of the bride of Christ. And there we will never argue or disagree or hurt each other or be disappointed in each other or suffer together. So I think, men, when we're showing our wife preciousness, honor, we do it because she is a fellow heir of grace with us. Where does all this go, men? So that your prayers will not be hindered. One of the things that can plug up the pipeline of your prayer life, men, is not living with your wife according to knowledge and not showing her honor, preciousness. And I think this could have implications for the way 
we do life together. Husbands, wives, when is the last time you locked arms or held hands and knelt down and prayed together and worshiped together? You know what's one thing that's beautiful about this? Because if you and your spouse are having uh, tension and you're having unconfessed sin that is hindering maybe your sexual relationship, maybe your uh, parenting is at odds, lots of things that can happen and do happen in every marriage, can I say? So you have to think. When you say, honey, let's pray together, that's a time that we can get on our knees and we can say, you know what, honey? Will you forgive me? You know what James 5 says? Confess your faults one to another. <laughs> Now, you guys have to be careful with this because I know when my wife and I were first married, we thought it was uh, our primary job to be each other's Holy Spirit. And so we'd go on walks, and I would tell her what I thought was wrong with her and how she needed to be more like Jesus, and she'd tell me the same. And that thing just went downhill really fast. <laughs> we found out that wasn't the best way to do sanctification together. We need a lot more grace. We needed some law, but man, we need to douse that law with a bucket full of grace. Now I want to give you some practical tips. These are not in the text. These are just some thoughts. And uh, every marriage is different. Every wife is different. Every husband is different. But I think these by principle, apply to all of us. Just to give you, what does it look like to be a man who lives with your wife according to knowledge and shows her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life? Let me give you nine things. Don't worry, we'll be out of here by noon. Number one, guys, we need more tenderness toward our wife. I'm a chicken when it comes to pain. I know some of you men are better than I. But typically, guys, if you have a cut or a wound, you know, you just become a little baby, and just like the four-year-old, you want your own Winnie the Pooh Band-Aid. You don't treat that spot the way you treat the rest of your body. There's a sensitivity there. Uh, and I think that's what it means, men, to be tender with our wife. You don't treat her like anything else. You don't treat her, you men that are in the military, you dare not treat your wife like a drill sergeant would treat his subjects. You might be boss out in the workaday world, but at home you show tenderness to your wife by the way you speak with her, by how you address her. In our case, the other day I called her Marcy and I had a hard time with it. I was like, that's strange. She's sweetie pie. She's my honey. I don't even call her Marcy much. But the way you talk to your wife. Remember, I was telling my kids, Earl Reese, he was up in his 70s. By the way, summer missionaries, he was one of my favorite room and board homes. He always called his wife Bunchy. I was like, man, that doesn't sound sexy, romantic, or anything. And then I found out, as I got to know Earl and Mavis Reese a little bit, they're both with the Lord now, but that, that it was a spinoff of Honey Bunch. It was their code language. So, honey, if I start calling you Bunchy, you'll know. Uh, why does your wife need tenderness, guys? Think about if we weren't governed according to the Bible and we were governed according to Darwinism. Did you know that in the theory of the survival of the fittest, that your wife would get eaten generally? She'd be lower than you on the food chain. And there'd be no recourse for her. And then she gets into a marriage, men, where you are macho. You're going to rule your domain like Tarzan of the jungle. You don't treat her like that. You treat her with tenderness. It's a scary thing to be a woman. Number two, men, we need to listen to our wife. I'll tell you what. What turns a man on is sex, and what turns a wife on is a husband that hears her heart. 
That's her love language. And again, I know everybody's different. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You've got to stop and you've got to focus. You've got to turn your brain off. You can't be listening to her with one ear, channel surfing with ESPN, and doing a checkbook and grunting, uh-huh. You've got to stop and look her in the face. And not do anything else. What does Proverbs 18, 13 tell us? If you hear out a matter, or if you answer a matter before you hear it out, it is a folly and a shame to you guys and to me. Um, number three, your wife needs affection. I'm talking about non sexual touches. You know, for guys, we tend to not get amped up about physical contact until it's going towards sex. You've got to know your wife's love language, but generally speaking, there's a holding of her hand and a stroking of her arm or putting her arm around you, around her that should lead her to not feeling like that's always leading toward the bedroom. You just are enjoying her for, for that. Just caresses. remember years ago... Uh, a young couple came to Marcy and I said, you know, we don't see people at GBF showing affection, couples. And I said, well, you know, everybody handles that differently. You know, some people just in public, they don't want PDA. If you go down to Mexico City and you walk down the street, you're going to see some PDA. My wife and I were just there with Jim and Carolyn. So I understand there's cultural things, love language things, boundaries that you and your wife or your spouse may feel are appropriate for you. But your wife needs affection. Number four, your wife needs security. Now this is really based out of Genesis 1 and 2, the creation story. Um, well, actually the fall. Man was given dominion over the earth to rule over the earth to name the animals. Then after the curse, uh, the Lord told the man, He said, by the sweat of your brow, you're going to get viruses on your computer, on your hard drive. You're going to have PowerPoint misfunctions. <laughs> you provide for your wife? Does she feel a safety there? Uh, I remember hearing about a couple out, out of Las Cruces where the guy was working three jobs a week just to keep, keep their family going. I don't know all the particulars there, but he was taking that seriously. On the Titanic... The women got off first and the men went down. And that's the way it should be. Women and children first. Women and children first. I think men, it also means this idea of security isn't just financial security, but it's the idea of emotional security. You should never men introduce in your vocabulary the idea or the hint that if such and such happens or doesn't, I'm going to leave you. I'm just going to check out on you. You see, the women need the confidence that you're not out flirting, that you will not disclose a level of your heart with another woman. That's one of the reasons women become clingy, because they're scared and they're, they don't feel that security. Number five, your wife needs development. Your wife should never wonder, what could I have been if I had just never met him? Remember the old Glenn Campbell song? These are the dreams of the everyday housewife who gave up the good life for me. Your wife should never be singing that. You know, our heavenly bridegroom has done us no wrong. Our relationship with Jesus Christ is such that he does all that he can to present us spotless and blameless without spot or wrinkle in glory. You've got to find out what your wife is good at. What gets her excited? What are her passions and dreams? What are her talents? And then, men, you take the time and the money to make that woman be what she would like to be. Number six. Time. T-I-M-E. Um... I think uh, 
you know, the recipe when we're dating is something that needs to carry over through 29 years of marriage, 40 years of marriage. If God gives you a longer life, 50 years of marriage. What do we do, guys, when we first meet our wife? We find a girl we like. We get that girl to like you back. We impress the girl until she becomes your girlfriend and wants to marry you. Then we relax. And then we share a home and our bills and our conflict and our kids and our stress with a girl who was your girlfriend and we don't go anywhere and we don't do anything. I think time, T-I-M-E. Remember Stephen Olford used to say when he was preaching at Calvary Baptist in New York City, he said, uh, Sunday was King's Day and Monday was Queen's Day. He and his wife would go up to the mountains in New York, upstate New York, and just spend the day together. Get away from the phone and the notes and the study and the counseling and just be together. I remember growing up as a, the youngest of four, being in the home of my brother Jim and his wife Carolyn and seeing this lived out, even while they were raising their two preschool children, Lisa and Les. And, you know, they've had 26 moves in 40 years. In fact, this month they're celebrating their 40th wedding anniversary by being for a whole month in the Canadian Rockies on Vancouver Island. Just enjoying life together. And I saw them doing that. This idea of a date night. So when I got married, I was like, man, that's a great idea. We need to leave the kids with somebody else and just be together. T-I-M-E. Remember, uh, I know there's a lot of negative stories. I, as I was thinking about this yesterday, I was at a coffee shop and I looked out through the window and there was this couple, young couple. I have no idea whether they were believers or unbelievers. And uh, I could tell they were married, but uh, they were young. And, you know, it was so encouraging because they didn't have their smartphones out. They weren't checking their text. When they talked to each other, they looked each other in the eye. You could tell they enjoyed being together. They were emotionally engaged. The husband with his wife and the wife with the husband. I thought, wow, that's so awesome. It's so encouraging. All right, number seven. Your wife needs help. I like uh, Laura Schlesinger's quote. She says, The sound of my husband vacuuming is foreplay. <laughs> you know, men, when you've had a busy day and you know where you hope things might be heading that evening, do you realize that you can, in your waffle brain, you just... You can check out and you're ready. And your wife has to clean up the kitchen and put the kids to bed and probably do about 8 to 12 other things on her checkoff list. And then you wonder why she's not amped up about what's about to transpire, as you are. So why don't you tell her to go to bed and you put the kids to bed and clean up the kitchen? It's easy for me to say now that all my kids are not toddlers anymore. Uh, number eight, she needs romance. I've already kind of touched on this one. And here I'm not talking about that effort part of your marriage where you go out and make money to provide for her. Not the sacrificial part of your marriage where you sign up to go to war to defend country and home. But I'm talking about that heartfelt part of writing notes to her and looking into her eyes and saying, I love you. Holding her. Maybe giving her a gift on some spontaneous day for no reason at all, but to say you're crazy about her and you're thinking about her. And then finally, uh, this whole idea of becoming a lifelong student of your wife, you've got to give your wife leadership. Your wife can't feel like all of her energies are being expended on the guy that is going nowhere. That drives a woman crazy. Um, and I'm a bad dancer. Maybe Josiah and Rachel, before they leave El Paso in a couple years, will get me straightened out. But you women, have you ever danced with a bad dancer? You're just like, man, let me take the lead. You know, your size 15 feet or not, you don't have any clue. So don't let your wife men in her frustration say, God, light a fire under my husband, whatever it takes. Instead, have her pray, God, give me the grace to stay up with this man. Now, you know, as I thought about this, you know, these types of sermons are hard because 
Guys, there's only one perfect husband, and he never had a biological, physical wife. And as I read my Bible, I discover he went back to the right hand of the Father about 2,000 years ago, so there's no perfect husbands available. Um, and I just, I was like, Lord, how do I close this so guys aren't just, you know, slinking out the back door? <laughs> and, and I came across an email by Tim Challies. Any of you guys familiar with Tim Challies? Great Canadian blogger. Lots of good things come out of Canada. And uh, I just want to read it to you as we close. I think it's an appropriate way on Father's Day as we talk to the husbands today. I'm almost quoting verbatim. I skipped a couple parts here and there. He says, I receive the emails often. The emails from the man who wonders how he, he of all people, could possibly lead his family. He's blown it. He has sinned too often. How could he lead after so many years of being so passive? Or maybe it is neither porn nor apathy, but fear. Fear of a woman who is so much wiser and so much more knowledgeable, who knows so much more about the Bible and so much more about the God of the Bible. How is he supposed to lead his wife and his family when she is the one who knows so much more? Whatever the reason, he hasn't led. He hasn't given direction to the family. He hasn't called the family together for devotions. He hasn't prayed with the kids. He hasn't stepped up and been a leader. And the longer he goes, the harder it gets. This is the most difficult time to lead. The most difficult time to lead is when you forfeited the respect of those who are meant to follow you, when your confidence in theirs is shattered. But this is also the most important time to lead. This is where a real man will and must lead. No one leads because he's worthy of the honor. In all of human history, there's only been one person who was a worthy leader and only one person who perfectly succeeded in his leadership. The rest of us, the best of us, are unworthy at best. We fumble along, we lead and stumble, we lead and fail, we lead and lose our way. We lead and hope desperately to learn something from it all. In all of human history, there's only been one person who was worthy. But the call to lead goes out to the unworthy as well. And so we lead, like it or not, confident or not, skillful or not, we lead. We don't lead because we're worthy, but because we're called. You don't lead because you're worthy, but because you're called. My friend, you have been called, commanded, and called by God Himself. If you're a husband, you've been called. If you're a father, you've been called. You've been called to lead. You and no one else. You've been called to lead despite your sin and your failure, despite your fear and your apathy. There is no backup plan. There is no one to lead in your absence. No one better suited. No one better qualified. It won't be easy, but it will be right. God always blesses when you do what's right. So ask forgiveness for your sin. Turn away from those failures. Put to death the doubt and the pride that traps you in inactivity. And lead. Lead gently. Lead humbly. Lead prayerfully. But lead. If you don't lead, who will? If not today, then when? You know what to do. So do it. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I don't want you to do this lightly, men, but if you are committed to lead by grace, I'd like for you just to stand where you're at. Everybody else remain seated. And I'm going to ask John Tibberts if he'll just pray for the men. So men, stand if you're prepared to lead your wife to be a lifelong student of your wife.